Hi, this is the Monday Tropical Tidbit on Hurricane Ian. As always, the thoughts here are mine alone, and in making decisions, please consult the National Hurricane Center and your local weather office for the best information for where you are. This is Hurricane Ian now strengthening to the west of Grand Cayman this morning, centered right about where that little dimple is that you might be able to make out depending on the resolution of the video you're watching. And what we're seeing on visible satellite imagery this morning is a convective structure where thunderstorms are wrapping in a band around the center and then spiraling inward, uh, forming the beginnings of an eye wall here to the west of Grand Cayman. And we can see that on the radar shot from Grand Cayman, illustrating that band of thunderstorms that kind of spirals inward and wraps around and terminates on the south side of the center, which is right there. So what we have is more of a spiral wrapping band structure rather than a closed eye wall ring. And the closed ring is kind of the sign that we're looking for that would signal a more rapid pace of intensification. So far through the last 12 hours or so when Ian began intensifying last night, we've seen a gradual pace of intensification, but not a rapid one just yet. This is the recon data going through this morning showing a fairly steady pressure in the low 980s. This is not significantly lower than it was 12 hours ago. Uh, maybe by about 5 or 10 millibars, uh, but it's not a crazy rate of strengthening yet. This has been good news for Grand Cayman, which I don't think has measured hurricane force conditions so far from this system, but tropical storm conditions are occurring there. And good news for Western Cuba as the system heads up. The longer this takes to start really ramping and getting a closed inner core structure, uh, the weaker it will be on arrival in Cuba. But we are expecting a strong hurricane either way. And whether the rate of intensification is slow or fast, it is going to be fairly strong when it gets there. We can see that there's strong wind on the east side. We've seen a little bit less on the southwest side. You see red and yellow here instead of purple. This illustrates how this eyewall has not fully wrapped around yet. And so this western side and southwest quadrant are still a little bit weak in terms of the max winds measured by the aircraft. So as we're thinking about Ian here, we're expecting this track over western Cuba somewhere, and the rest of the track forecast will be very sensitive to the exact location along Cuba that Ian crosses over. If it's over the very tip of Cuba, then it could end up farther west in the Gulf. If it's a little closer to the Isle of Youth, we could see a quicker turn toward the Florida Peninsula. So sensitivity here on little details, and unfortunately the forecast we're about to discuss is kind of balancing on a knife's edge in terms of impacts to Florida specifically. But we do know that no matter what happens, Western Cuba here will be getting the brunt of the core of the storm and a hurricane warning is in effect for that entire area. Now here's the GFS showing the mid-level moisture and wind flow. So you can see the hurricane crossing on Tuesday morning, tomorrow morning, just over the western part of Cuba. Now if you look at the last couple of runs of the GFS, you'll see just a slight shift from where it was on prior runs. So you see a little bit of a more northeasterly position come Tuesday morning. And this has resulted in a slight edge toward uh, the western Florida coastline on the GFS, ending up here. And if you look at the last couple of runs, it was farther west uh, last night and uh, yesterday afternoon on some of these runs. So we have seen a shift east in the GFS a little bit closer to the western Florida coastline. And perhaps one of the reasons for that is if we look at the two-day trend in 500 millibar height for the United States, you'll see the hurricane here on Wednesday morning. And you can see the black contours outlining this big trough, outlining this big trough over the northeastern U.S., and these blue colors illustrate that 500 millibar height is lower on recent runs compared to runs a day or two ago. So the trough is trending towards a little bit deeper, digging in farther south over Virginia and North Carolina. That's also causing height falls to the east of Florida because the steering ridge to the east is getting pressed by this trough a little bit farther to the southeast and opening up a lane for the hurricane to move a little bit farther east and into the Florida Peninsula instead of staying out over the Gulf of Mexico. So we've seen that kind of trend in the GFS, but we've seen a little bit of a different one recently from the European model, which was farther east than the GFS yesterday, but now is farther west, remaining offshore of Tampa Bay and slowing up here off the coast and then undergoing weakening as it kind of moves off toward the northwest uh, as it starts getting sheared and follows the low level flow out of the east more than the upper level flow out of the southwest. Now, speaking of this weakening here, we know that we're going to have uh, competing steering influences on the hurricane as it moves up into the eastern gulf. This is the GFS low level flow on Wednesday morning. So again, you see the hurricane here. Now remember, we have a big trough 
that's digging in over the eastern U.S. Behind that trough is a bunch of cold air, a big dome of colder than average air over this part of the country, and we have a big area of high pressure as a result centered over northeast Texas on this forecast. So you see a big belt of northeasterly flow coming down over Alabama, Mississippi, Louisiana, and that is pushing on the storm from this direction away from Florida. But we know that the upper level flow is out of the southwest pushing the storm toward Florida. You can see that here in the upper level wind flow. So you have the trough here, big jet, and this is all pushing. You can see the ridge, steering ridge off to the northeast of the Bahamas, all southwesterly flow, pushing on the storm, subtropical jet coming across, all trying to push the storm toward Florida. But the low level flow with the cold dome to the north is trying to push the storm away. So these two end up doing two things. They slow the storm down because the two steering flows are in opposite directions, and they're also at different vertical levels, so that represents a vertical wind shear. Uh, lower levels are very different from the upper levels, and that starts weakening the storm, especially if it slows down a lot. And we can see that on both the Euro and the GFS, you'll notice weakening at the time of landfall. We see a, a marked change from a closed green ring, which indicates a healthy eyewall, to half of a ring, where you only have green over the northern half dry over the southern half because of that very strong southwesterly shear, which means that the left side of that shear vector will see the strongest rain rates and strongest winds. So the northern and northwestern eyewall would likely be strongest as the storm is getting toward the coast and starting to weaken here. Now these details are going to matter so much for Florida, and it's unfortunate that it's balanced on such a knife's edge because there's a range of outcomes here in terms of the media impacts to the western Florida Peninsula coastline. On a run like the GFS, where the system just edges far enough east to approach the Tampa Bay area, it gets here while the eyewall is still fairly strong. So you could have very strong surge, wind, and rain-related impacts all along the coast from a potentially major hurricane winds over 100 miles per hour very strong surge potentially into the bay and along the coastline here wherever that approaches and then it slowly moves up the coastline or inland but if you get something like the europeans uh, re most recent run where it kind of slows up offshore you'll still get elevated wind and you'll still get storm surge being pushed into the coast either way but in terms of raw wind power you'll get much less over this section of coastline because the hurricane eye is staying offshore and you also see a lot more dry slotting which reduces the rainfall and flash flooding potential over the florida peninsula so this would be a better outcome all the way around but there's almost no way to guarantee which one of these kinds of outcomes is going to happen i don't have a magic insight to tell you this one of the things we'll be watching very carefully over the next day and day and a half is exactly where Ian crosses Western Cuba and when it emerges on the other side, is it moving northward or is it moving slightly west of northward? And that will give us a clue right away as to how close this is likely to track to Florida. Little differences there, like I showed you, uh, could mean a lot later. And uh, this is the only thing we're really going to be watching is the, the direction the storm is moving, everything else little details that humans can't forecast perfectly. We have a pretty tight range of outcomes now. We know it's going to be near the western Florida Peninsula and it's going to stall, but is it going to stall offshore or is it going to stall near the coastline? And that's really the key here. Now, if it does stall offshore, it's worth noting that we would start thinking about impacts to the Florida Panhandle instead. And if you follow uh, runs like the European, they will go a little closer to shore and weaken as they do so and we'll probably have rain still on the north side potential for storm surge is really really bad in this part of the coastline the big bend alligator point apalachicola these parts of the panhandle are very low lying and so even a weakening hurricane would be pushing a lot of water funneled up the coastline and would be pushed right in uh, to that section of Florida. So don't let your guard down in terms of storm surge impacts and even a windy cyclone that's weakening, maybe you know a Cat 1 hurricane or something coming up into the panhandle, could still down a lot of trees in this part of North Florida and cause power outages. So certainly no lack of impacts, even if the storm stays offshore for longer and is able to weaken before finally making a landfall. This is the National Hurricane Center official forecast. And right now, I showed you a couple different outcomes there on the model runs, but the consensus has gotten pretty close to the Tampa Bay area in recent runs. And so the, the Hurricane Center is following that consensus and is just offshore of Tampa. 
on 8 a.m. Thursday. And you note how slow the hurricane's moving from Wednesday morning to Thursday morning, 24 hours here. So it's really slowing down to a near stall at this time. We have a hurricane watch on the coastline. And uh, this is, you know, an awful situation for surge. Like I mentioned, uh, this is the current expectation from the NHC official forecast showing water level rises across all of western Florida from the Keys up to Tampa Bay, but that's where the highest values are expected. They have a track that comes up and moves very, very slowly just to the west of Tampa Bay. That's unfortunately a really bad setup because you'd have southwesterly winds or southerly winds pushing water right into the bay if the hurricane is actually located just to the west. If there's any kind of silver lining, it's that if the eye is here and the hurricane is beginning to get severely sheared, again, the northwestern Iowa would be by far the strongest. So if we can hope for something here, it would be that the southeast eye wall would weaken and we would have less wind available to push the water into the bay. But it's going to be a high water rise no matter what the outcome here. Even if the hurricane stays offshore, again, it's moving slowly, which gives ample time for a lot of water to be pushed toward the shoreline. So we are expecting flooding on the coast from storm surge, and there could be flash flooding due to inland rainfall as well. You'll see the path of the cyclone uh, kind of pushes a swath of heaviest rain near and to the northwest of where the eye tracks on the Hurricane Center forecast. And so you might get some corridor across central Florida if the hurricane eventually moves inland. And you'll also have trailing rain bands that will deal rainfall to the rest of the Florida Peninsula as well. You'll notice there are some lessened values inland, and uh, part of the reason for that could be due to the wind shear having a dry slotting effect. You'll see that there's a lot of dry air getting wrapped into the hurricane that gets pushed in as the shear picks up. So you'll see this dry slot wrapping in. That would hopefully save some folks from some freshwater flooding risks, but it's hard to guarantee where the position of this dry slot will be. If the hurricane is just a little bit farther west, this band out in front of deep moisture could be raining over southeast Florida for a long period of time, and it's really hard to predict rain bands in advance. So there could be areas of isolated heavy rainfall that do cause flooding problems, and so there is a flash flooding risk on this hurricane center forecast. So do be prepared if you're in a flood prone area. Water is the biggest danger in hurricanes, not the wind, as many believe. But the wind will be a problem. We have a hurricane watch here, tropical storm watch farther south, and a tropical storm warning for the Keys. So be ready for the full range of impacts of this major hurricane as it comes up toward Florida. Again, the story here is that it's kind of on a knife's edge in terms of direct wind and surge impacts to the western Florida coastline. There are a range of outcomes here, but we do know that the hurricane will be getting close. And what you really should do in this case is prepare for the reasonable worst case scenario. So you kind of have to assume that we get something that's really close to the coastline causing maximum impacts to uh, the central Florida coast or the Big Bend area. So expect that, prepare for that, and hope for an outcome that's a little bit better. Maybe it stays offshore and weakens more. That would be nice, but we can't assume that's going to happen right now. That's it for now. Thanks for watching. Stay safe.